Tonight, um, we have Fawn Custer, who is the volunteer coordinator for Coast March, a program in Oregon Shores. Um, this is where volunteers take a section of the oceanfront, a mile section, something like that. They monitor it on a regular basis for dead sea life, uh, illegal riprap, uh, erosion, anything that's affecting the, the beach. So if any of you have free time and want to adopt a mile, you, this is the person to talk to. So please welcome Vaughn Custer. talking to a mic because I'm so used to talking She's over water that um, I'm not used to talking in a normal tone. <laughs> so I get loud, you know, excuse me. Um, thank you, Don. As I was, um, as he introduced, I am the volunteer coordinator with Coach Watch. I have the good job. I get to go out on the beach and play with volunteers uh, throughout the year and learn and find new things all the time and help explain what everybody's finding on the beach. Um, so, you know, a lot of people come to the beach for different reasons. Some is to, to explore, uh, some to challenge themselves, just some for quiet contemplation, just to get away from, you know, all the busyness of being in the city, which, you know, we don't have to deal with too much on the beach, but only when we have to take those travels to Portland, which are always traumatic, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of people want a little bit more from their experience at the beach. They want to be involved a little bit more and find out what's going on. And so when you see up here, some people that are actually uh, involved in the Sea Star Monitoring Survey and, and people that are involved with the um, Marine Debris Survey as well. And, and then down the bottom, the right-hand side, this is just a group of people who have joined us for our Shoreline Science Workshop. And, and uh, key through that program is prepared to get wet. You're, you're going to come every day, and you're going to get wet. Um, the chances of staying dry are pretty slim. And as you can see, we all have a good time no matter what on the beach. But when we're out there, um, you know, this is something that we've been looking for over. Yeah, I know. I've got Phillips. It, it's not, you know, just in remembrance, he's still around. Uh, but Philip is uh, our director who started Coast Watch 20 years ago because he'd been sitting in another meeting in Salem finding out that uh, stuff had happened on the beach he'd miss out on. He felt that the one way that we could keep a better eye on the beach is to have people adopt a mile and, and become one with your mile, feel your mile, know your mile. And so this is uh, where Coast Watch started. And with that, we've had volunteers who have been able to call and say, uh, there's this big dock sitting on the beach out here or uh, in Walport when they thought they took it off. We get a call from Walport saying, uh, the ship is sitting on the beach here in Walport. I think they did a poor job on that. So <laughs> things we discover, and not, and not only the big stuff, but also the small stuff. Um, so who are we? We've got about 1,300 volunteers, but we always need more because we have 363 miles of beach. And so that's a lot to cover, and we don't always get there every single day. As a matter of fact, I had one of our volunteers who uh, submitted their report yesterday and said, okay, I'll see you in May when we get back, because they're <laughs> heading to Arizona, uh, and they do this every year. And, uh, but while they're here, I get quite a few good reports from them. And we are celebrating over 20 years of volunteerism with um, Coast Watch. So one of the things, as I mentioned, is that when we're down the beach, we are looking not only for natural things that are happening, but unnatural things. Um, for example, like the dock that washed up in on the beach, uh, to Noah's surprise, because they didn't expect it to be coming here all that soon. And, and it showed up on the beach in June, of all things, not in the winter storms that we thought this would happen. Uh, and then, of course, other incidents, for example, what you see on the right-hand side, which is a dock that washed out of the Coquille River and that got um, caught up in uh, Lighthouse Beach down there in between storms. And then, of course, the storm came in before they could get the styrofoam out. So what you see there is not snow. It's uh, styrofoam pellets that have been broken down from... Um, that uh, debris. And of course, they were able to get out there and get some big chunks, chunks, but they're still now for over a year out there frequently, you know, doing uh, sifting with seeds to get as much of their little pellets out. But, you know, we're not the only ones. Um, there, 
750 residents of a tiny island of Akima also have a story of their own. And so with that, I'm going to switch things here so you guys can watch this film. Um, this is a film that was um, sent to me. And uh, the cool thing is, is that I actually grew up in an island north of that. So looking at this one is really sweet. I get all mushy, but um, yeah, it's a, but it's really sad because when I grew up there, it was a very pristine beach. And so <coughs> it's interesting to see what they're having to deal with on their beaches uh, at this point. So the one thing I learned from this, and you guys probably do too, is that the first three numbers on the UPC symbol tell you the country. That was pretty cool to me. I really had no idea about that. But most of the debris that we get by the time it's made it from Asia, we're not seeing too many of the UPC symbols, but it'd be really interesting to learn. Um, so it, here in Oregon, of course, with the looming prospect, as you can see, of the tsunami coming, uh, we did manage to get together a partnership between Surfrider, Wash the Shore, which is an organization down in Bandy, which turns this marine debris into massive sculptures. Solve, uh, Sea Grant as our uh, government organization to help with funding, and of course, Oregon Shores. Um, so this became our marine debris team. And so our question is, how can we help? And I'm sure your question is too, how can we help? Well, one of the ways that you can is um, to be on the beach um, to help with scouting for any debris that you find out there. Um, to then help with beach cleanups when possible. And what we really need are some volunteers who will help with the monitoring that we already have set up um, along the coastline. We have 10 sites that are set up. So with this, with scouting, Coast Watch has already kind of taken a lead because we're already out on the beach. Um, and for that, as the re uh, reports come in, which is normally quarterly, uh, one of the things that we're, they're reporting on is not only um, you know, the dead seals <laughs> that we're seeing on the beach, um, but also other organisms that are washing up, washing up, washing up on the beach as well, or um, debris. Um, we obviously encourage more, re um, more visits to the beach and more reports whenever possible. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we're always encouraging you volunteers. The other thing is, is that um, we're always in need of people who can get out there to the remote or you know, more rugged areas. Uh, at our uh, Cape Perpetua celebration, it was really nice to meet this gentleman in Britain who actually had his uh, quadra plane. Is that what he said for us to call it instead of the quadra. drone? <laughs> the quadcopter? Uh, who actually took it out around Cape Perpetua mile 191 and took photographs. And so he's adopting that section of the beach that we can't get to. So he's working with another volunteer who's got the one fourth of the beach that he can walk. And then Britain is video um, videotaping and uh, taking photographs of the remote area. But if you have people who horseback ride or if you horseback ride or really like nice long hikes on the dunes, we're always looking for people to adopt miles there and to look for debris. Um, the top piece that you see up there that looks like it's from the top of a pagoda washed up on my little tiny beach there in Seal Rock. Um, so we are, and we are still finding um, tsunami debris that's coming in as well. We are, of course, focusing on our five marine reserves, and yours, of course, right here being the Cape Perpetua. So one of the things that we're trying to do is make sure that we have a lot of citizen science taking place in our marine reserves to kind of make that connection between the research that's happening off and the research that's happening on shore. Um, for you guys, one of the things that we ask, of course, is that if you've not already adopted a mile, that you adopt a mile. Um, example 192 here is a poor little mile that's actually easily accessible, but um, has been neglected for a couple of years. And so it could use some tender loving care and observation. Uh, there are quite a few other miles in that area. 191, like I said, it's covered 190. Um, needs help, it was 187, and um, so these are all miles heading south, and then uh, up north, we don't, pretty much up north, we have a lot of beaches that are covered, but anytime that you want to get out and walk on the beach, even if it's not your mile, we, we'd love to have you get out there and then you know, um, report what you find, 
it's really helpful to us and it's really helpful to find out what kind of debris is still washing up on the beach. Okay, um, this is, and when we um, see this, what we want to do, of course, is uh, deal with the rapid response. The netting that you see down here is from a crab boat that went down a few years back. But this went, uh, all this rope washed up on the north side of Yaquinta Head um, and on the rock, so they could only get down there at a minus tide with um, knives and you know bags to try and carry this rope all the way back up. You know, if you've ever been down to Cobble Beach, those are quite a few steps to walk back up for all of this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, the other thing, of course, is the dock. You see on the right-hand side, as I showed you before, this is what happened at the Lighthouse Beach down near um, Charleston. But this past year, up here in Salishan, on the bottom center picture, uh, two docks washed down the river, Celeste River. And a volunteer who was actually, well, actually it was a gentleman across the bay who had a friend who was one of our volunteers who lived there at Salishan, who called and said, I've got this big chunk of styrofoam, and I'm not sure what it is. So I called a few of our volunteers there, and we were able to collect all that styrofoam before it broke up into little tiny pieces. And the same down here in, or up here, <laughs> north of here, in Bayshore, uh, again, another volunteer happened to see the big chunks of white styrofoam and called, and so I called our beach ranger and the volunteers who lived there on Bayshore to get out there very quickly and, and haul that big styrofoam in before it broke up in little pieces. So this is how you can help um, as far as um, you know, keeping the debris off of our beaches as well and breaking up into these tiny little pellets. Um, and the monitoring surveys, these are really important because it's giving us a, a really good picture of what's happening along the coast. We've always kind of known we've had debris washed up on the beach and, and not always sure where it's come from, if it's domestic, if it's ours coming down the river, or if it's always coming from offshore, or even where it's coming from offshore. And so with the monthly surveys that we've been doing now since about 2012, uh, 2011 in some areas, um, is to go out once a month to the same spot for it's all the same 100 meters and collect all the debris and then identify the debris that you see and record that. And so she showed you the form. Yep, those are the same forms we have. They're very simple. Um, for example, this one is all plastic, so they have it nice and categorized for you. Um, no major rocket science. If it's really big, then you like really big. Um, <laughs> and if you see anything else, then you know there are places to record it. But the whole idea of this is to keep in mind that we do have this debris coming in as well. Um, when we look at the picture of the far, um, your far right on the bottom there, uh, what you'll notice is the way the wood is cut. That's because they don't build the way we build. Um, they still use an old horse and tenant. Um, you know, we're lazy Americans here. We've got our 16 penny nail guns and our two by fours and bam, 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 you know, and we got a house. Uh, these guys actually take some time. So this is one way to identify if this is um, debris that's coming from the tsunami. Um, this was up at uh, Camp Westwind when I was up helping them with their survey just uh, about three months ago. And what you see is a big blue crate here. This is pretty good size. There were Asian mussels in that. Mm -hmm. So again, we're still getting these items. And it's, we're not as much concerned about the items that have been on land, you know, but those that were in the water first, before the tsunami hit, because those are the ones that are going to have the um, species on there that are native to Japan. And so I'm sure you guys have all heard about the striped beak fish. Uh, we now have three of them that have survived and made it all the way to the Oregon coast. Um, one is at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, one is now at the Oregon Coast Aquarium, and one is up in Seaside. The first one came up in Seaside when that little skiff washed up there, and in the hold uh, were five of those striped beak fish. And so uh, Keith Chandler, who is the curator for the Seaside Aquarium and Marine Mammal Stranding, went out there and he scooped out one little fish and took it back to the aquarium and called the authorities. They came and euthanized everything else. But Tsunami Sue is alive and well to Seaside Aquarium. So you can say that a few times really quick. But all of her cousins, and I have one, to, you know, didn't quite survive. Um, but, you know, that's letting us know that because of man-made debris, we're actually getting their organisms that are alive. Um, if this had been the tsunami that had hit 300 years ago or so, we wouldn't 
see that because we didn't have any of the man-made structures that these organisms could live on. And so this is why there's a little bit more of a concern with what we're, um, what we're bringing the crop with our debris. Oh, I should say, up here um, I, on our coast calendar, we do have, um, I try to get up there every three months that each of the teams is going out. So if you just happen to be on the coast or happen to be at the beach on that uh, day that they're going out and you'd like to participate, the more hands the merrier, especially, you know, when the weather's getting really nasty and the uh, sun's going down quickly while the tide's going coming in. Um, it's better to have a lot more hands out there to quickly collect all the uh, debris. Then you can take it in, um, nice dry area, look at it, sort it out, and then upload the data. They could also just use somebody if you're just, you can't get out of the beach, but you have access to the computer. They've got a lot of people who have their data sheets, but they just haven't had the time to get their data uploaded. So they can always use volunteers that way as well. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have our 10 survey sites. Obviously, Nero Consular, which is the closest one next to you guys here in Cape Perpetual Marine Protected Area, um, is always in need of extra volunteers to go out with them. Uh, the next one in the south is to Hot Ditch. That's, only, that's if you really like a good hike. It's a half mile through the dunes, through a nice little forested area, then out to the beach, and then, of course, um, coming back um, through the nice little forested area up the dunes. So you get your workout. Trust me, the back of your leg will be nice and strong when you're there. So that's a good one for a workout. But any of these along the um, coastline here are always looking for additional people to pop out with them, you know, depending on which month you happen to be around. And you can see these on the calendar. Another citizen science thing that I want to bring up because we are talking about the storms that are starting to bring debris in again, and that is we have our king tides that are starting October 27th. These are the highest high tides that we normally get throughout the year, and actually the highest one's going to be in November. But what we start to see is if there's a storm surge that's coming in in October along with this high tide, we're going to see um, these waves that are obviously going to have an impact on the um, shoreline, and they're going to bring debris in a lot higher and up in the logs and uh, uh, over the uh, overtopping some of the dunes that we normally wouldn't see. Uh, this is a picture that I took last year, um, you know, right over there in Walport, where you could look at the little trailer park, and this is a normal low tide, and that was the king tide, and the water was actually up on the grass up there. And that wasn't, you know, a major storm surge, but I know some of you may remember one back in the 80s when um, the water was lapping through the houses in Walport over on the edge there, and all the logs were brought up on Oda Beach, that curve that you had to drive around. I had uh, one of our volunteers up in um, at Manhattan Beach, the teacher there who's doing the survey, said, yeah, she remembers there being a gray whale that was brought up onto 101 in Rockaway when the storm surged, and they had to drive around it for two weeks because they were so busy trying to get the trees and everything else off the road and all those landslides that the whale was not that big of a deal. So, <laughs> things to be aware. Um, so, if you'd like to get involved with taking photographs, I have information on the King Tide um, project also on the table as well. Um, our projects for Coast Watch, as I mentioned, we, we are focusing on our marine reserves. Um, citizen science is a little bit more focused. Um, Karen is uh, the lead on the Yaha Sea Star Survey, and she'd always love to have people go out with her. We're kind of down for the winter because the low tides, of course, are at 3 in the morning, and uh, it's a little hard to see. So uh, starting back up in the spring, we'll get out there and start measuring the little tiny sea stars and all, all of our sea stars again. But we're always looking for people to help with the marine debris, okay? And even to just simply report it. If you find marine, marine debris on your beach, um, be sure to um, give me a call or report it. We also, you can go on to the omdt.org and um, contact there. You can also um, go on to, or you can call 211, uh, which is an emergency if it's some sort of debris <coughs> that you feel is unsafe and that needs to be taken care of immediately. And either way, we can get somebody out there to take care of it. Dealing with the scouting, rapid response and monitoring, adopting your model, and of course, we also offer out outreach of a variety of different ways with workshops, um, conferences, and presenters. 
Um, we did our workshop this summer, and then we will have our Sharing the Coast Conference, which is always open to the public. Um, this year, uh, Swap is going to host us down there in Key Bay. So it's always fun to come down there and check out a new beach that you've not been to before. Um, and again, your opportunities to help by adopting your mile. You can always support Coast Watch by um, becoming an Oregon Shore <coughs> or simply by donation. And you can learn a little bit more about us at OregonShores.org. And there's my information. This is my cell phone. You're free to call me pretty much any time. I should warn you that my phone doesn't work between midnight and 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> I can turn it off then. But other than that, I've had calls while I've been sitting on the, you know, the rim of the Grand Canyon, okay? <laughs> sitting in the plane, getting ready to go, saying, uh, Father, there's something wrong with the sea stars here. What's this purple water? So, uh, yeah, so feel free to give me a call about any of this. I have on the table of there some examples of some of the organisms that came in on the dock from the tsunami, um, and also uh, some information on the marine debris surveys that we're doing as well. So if you're interested in any of that information, uh, feel free to sign, um, sign up on there, just give me your email or take some information, my card, and feel free to give me a call. Any questions? that were adults that were, you know, in contact with each other all 